Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium. And in this video, we are going to continue our discussion on ChatGPT. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make this video into three passes, where in the first pass, I'm gonna just give a brief overview like I have been in my previous videos of just describing this entire process of how does ChatGPT work? Probably in like two minutes or so. And then in the next pass, I'm going to go into further details of this step three over here. And then we're going to further then like describe each and every single one of these components in greater detail. So if you wanna get a better understanding of how reinforcement learning is used in ChatGPT, you've come to the right place. So let's get started. So pass one, how does ChatGPT actually work? So we're given, let's say right now, we have a GPT network, which is already pre-trained to understand language in general. And it is also fine tuned to specifically answer an input user prompt. So the way that it is fine tuned here is that we'll have labelers that will give in an example prompt as well as a response. And then it's going to be fed to the network for fine tuning and then fine tuning parameters to be specific. Then once that's done, we now have a fine tuned model or a supervised fine tuned model, which is called SFT here. Then in step two, what we'll do is take a single prompt, pass it through the model multiple times. In this case, we'll pass it through the model four times in order to get four different responses. Then we'll have a labeler rank these responses of how well they actually liked these responses in terms of factualness, toxicity, and just other aspects of more human-like characteristics and optimal behavior. And in when I say rank, it's also going to be giving a specific number between one and seven to each of these numbers. And this is known as the ranking via a Likert scale, which I've explained a lot more in my other video when talking about this rewards model. So check it out. These rankings are then gonna be used to train a rewards model. The rewards model is also another separate GPT architecture, which takes in an input prompt. It also takes in one possible response and the output of this is going to be a number from like one to seven to just show how high quality is this response for this input prompt. Like I said, for more details, just check out my other video. Now for step three, we use both of these models together. So we have a supervised fine tuned model to which we pass an unseen input. Then we'll get some response that comes from uh, the normal GPT architecture. And then we then pass it to our rewards model to understand how high quality was this response for this specific prompt. And this reward is then going to be used to fine tune the parameters of our supervised fine tune model. And so this is how our supervised fine tune model is going to incorporate more human-like characteristics and behavior via reinforcement learning. And this model then becomes ChatGPT, and that's how we have the ChatGPT that's so awesome today. That's gonna do it for the first pass of this explanation, and I hope that gives you a good overview of exactly how ChatGPT is constructed. Now, what we're gonna do is we're going to go on to the second pass, and in this pass, I'm going to focus on step three and specifically just these components of what we're doing with reinforcement learning. So let's get to it. So let's go through this entire flow again, adding more details. We have an unseen prompt that we pass through the supervised fine tuned model, which generates a response. Now I wanna actually go through exactly the mechanism and how the GPT model will generate this response. So what does a response look like from GPT? So we have the supervised fine-tuned model of GPT, specifically GPT 3.5. Now the input to this is going to be a user prompt and also all the words that were generated prior for this specific prompt. In this case, this is the beginning, so we'll have like a start token. We input this to GPT in our first time step and this is going to generate our actual first word or the next word, which is today in this case for what is for breakfast. 
Now in the next time step, today will now be a part of the input along with everything that came before it that we mentioned before, and it will generate now the next word in the sequence, which is say, I. And then this process repeats where we take now the word that was generated as the input for the next time step, and we generate the next word, which is will. Then have, then French, and toast. And so you can see that the GPT model over here is going to generate one word at a time using all of the previous words that it had come before it as an input context. And so we have a user prompt. We pass it into the supervised fine tune model to generate one word at a time until all of the words have been generated for that response. Then this entire response is going to be passed along with the input prompt to the rewards model that is already trained. And so what it's gonna do is it's going to tell us how good was this response for this input prompt. We'll get a reward, and we now use this reward to fine tune our original supervised fine tuned model of GPT. Now, in order to make updates to parameters, it has to be used somehow in the loss function. And this is exactly what we do with this PPO model or technique. How is the GPT model updated? It is updated via proximal policy optimization. Policy optimization techniques in general are a class of techniques that try to maximize the total reward scene. And specifically in the proximal policy optimization case, the way it accomplishes this is using the reward in the loss function itself. This function you can consider is like the negative of the loss function. And so we want to kind of maximize whatever this value here is. This product of this R function, as well as this advantage function A, it is going to be proportional to the reward. And so higher the reward, we're going to have like a much higher value for this entire function. And that is going to influence the direction of the parameters in our GPT network. These theta are the parameters of our original GPT model. I'm gonna explain the individual terms here in my next pass, but for now, I hope you kind of just get to understand what proximal policy optimization is trying to do in general. It is trying to optimize or maximize the total reward seen by our network. Now let's get to the pass three, where we dive into further details. For our pass three, I want to actually take a look a little closer into this model itself. And just, we saw in pass two how it generates one word at a time, but how exactly does it select which word to generate at every single time step? So let's consider now our example for, we have our original GPT model, we have an input prompt, and it has been generating words one at a time. Like it generated first today, then I, then will, then have, then French, and now it is at the step where it should try to generate what should come next. Based on this input, as well as everything, you know, everything that's come before it will also be an input here as well. Every single time that it needs to make this decision, it's going to have like, a table in its brain. And this table is of a probability distribution. It's a table of words, as well as the probability that they will occur next for this given input prompt and given response that has been generated until now. So in this case, it's going to say, okay, there's like a 38% chance that toast is gonna to be coming and filling in this. There's 27% chance that it's gonna be fries. And there's an 8% chance that it's gonna be bread and maybe like there's some other words that come after this in the table. But to actually decide the exact word that's going to be done, G Ch GPT is not gonna just choose the top one and be like, oh, this toast is definitely gonna be it. Because in general, in language specifically, we don't always as humans say the most optimal word that's going to come next. It's just not going to sound very human. And so what's gonna happen instead is we have this probability distribution and according to this distribution, we're going to just sample a word. So there's a higher probability that toast is going to be selected, but it's not guaranteed that toast is going to be selected. And let's say that in this case, if I pick, a, pick some word, it just happens to be toast, and that's great. Then toast will come 
and fill this blank. But it could have very well been fries or bread at any point of time. And because this table is generated anew every single time we get a new input, and these inputs can be different every single time we use the, even the same request prompt, this is kind of why GPT, as you've seen probably in this initial case, that it can, it can actually create different responses despite having the same input prompt. And because this response can be different every single time, even for the same prompt, we want to pass it into the rewards model just to check how good it actually was as a response. And like I mentioned in previous passes, we use this reward in our fine tuned model to actually change the gradients and make some gradient update every single time we have an input prompt. Now let's actually get into details about the loss function that's used to make the gradient updates. So like I mentioned before, this is the loss function or rather the negative of that loss function that we want to maximize. Theta is the parameters of our original GPT architecture and is going to be the parameters of our chat GPT model to come. Now T over here is going to be every single time we have one complete response, that is one time step. R is going to be a ratio or a rewards ratio, where it is the ratio of rewards with the new parameters for the given input prompt divided by the reward of the old parameters with the same given input prompt. And so if this is a very high number, that's way over one, that means that whatever parameter updates we're thinking to make now, they're actually going to be better, at least for this specific input prompt than what it, when the old GPT was for the previous time step. And so ideally we would want to make these gradient updates in general. Now, A is going to be called the advantage function. And in reinforcement learning, the advantage function is a value that assesses how high quality the output was with respect to the input, which in our case is the same thing as a number that's proportional to the reward. And so overall, this product of R and A is going to be very high if the response is very good. And it's going to be very low, that is either like closer to even negative because this advantage function can be negative if the response is very bad, at least for this given input. And so we want this product to be as high as possible. And that's kind of exactly what these policy optimization techniques do they try to maximize the total reward. Now, this is, this is great, but we also don't want to make the gradient update a little too large because typically in learning, we want to learn step by step. And so in order to make sure that the gradient update is not too large, we will try to clip the upper and lower bounds of this ratio. And in this case, it, we can clip it by an arbitrary value of epsilon. We choose one as the center because if like the rewards ratio is one, that means that the new parameters reward is equal to the old parameters reward, which means that in downstream, like the parameters themselves don't change. How large epsilon is will quantify how much we are allowing the gradient updates to change after looking at like a single example user prompt. For example, if it was between, if it was like 0.1 epsilon, that means that this rewards ratio be confined between 0.9 and 1.1, which means that we are only going to make minor gradient updates overall. And in fact, that's also why we're taking the minimum of this, of these two values so that we have literally the smallest update that we will be able to make. Now, why do we have an expectation over here? Well, this kind of goes to the fact that I mentioned before how we can generate for the same input multiple kinds of responses. And so we would want to simulate this input, the same input into GPT like multiple times over. And then we'll take an average of those values. And so this entire thing won't just be reliant on a simple like arbitrary output that chat GPT happened to produce. And so we take this final value and we then make gradient updates via gradient ascent. Because now this is not a loss function, it's like the negative of the loss function, something that we are trying to maximize. And so we're going to keep performing this update for every time step T, that is every single time we see a user input response pair. And over time, this value of theta is just going to get better and better 
until eventually we'll get a model that is just non-toxic to a very high degree, factual to a very high degree, sounds more human to a very high degree. And that is ChatGPT that we see today. So that's gonna do it for pass three and also the conclusion of this video. And I kind of hope that this entire explanation helps you better understand exactly what is going on in step three. I have separate videos for step two and going to be making another video for step one in the near future. So do stay in tune for that. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all got a good understanding of what's going on here with this wonderful chat GPT stuff. And I will see you in another video. Bye-bye.